have seen this as you go. After you're actually supposed to sing the first and the second stanzas of it, and then you go to the chorus. So uh, I guess we'll do all that and then go through the chorus one time. So it'll be happiness is no savior, living a life in his favor. Happiness change in my behavior. Happiness is the Lord. Then happiness is a new creation. Jesus and me in close relation. Having a part in his salvation, happiness is the Lord. Then it's real joy is mine, no matter where the teardrop starts. So we got to get about right. This time I'm going to give myself a little bit of a chance to be in the right range. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change. In my behavior, happiness is the Lord. Try that much again. Happiness is to know the Savior living a life within his favor, having a change. In my behavior, happiness is the Lord. Next one. Happiness is a new creation, Jesus and me. In close relation, having a part. In his salvation, happiness is the Lord. Real joy is mine, no matter if you drop star. I found the secret, it's Jesus in my heart. Let's do the rest of it. Happiness is to be forgiven, living a life that's worth the living, taking a trip that's bound for heaven. Happiness is
say at their times when we may speak to them and help us in those moments and how to say what we have to say. We pray, Father, that you would enable them to have a, a, a spiritual awakening so that they can feel like they're not to be here. And I pray for this in Jesus' name. Amen. And I'm going to ask, would you close those two in order? Oh, yeah. 
Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. You may remember he built a wall around it, and uh, uh, he besieged it and basically took what he wanted, which this is what this verse says. The Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the vessels of the house of God, and he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and brought the vessels into the treasury of his God. So uh, Nebuchadnezzar goes uh, up and, and besieges Jerusalem, takes a bunch of stuff from the temple, uh, from the city itself, and just brings it all, whatever he wants, back to uh, his area there. He calls it in the land of Shinar. Whether this is Babylon per se, can't really tell you. I uh, don't know where his treasury was, but uh, he brings it to his country and puts all of those things that belonged in the house of God uh, in his, in his uh, treasury or in his uh, vast supply. I'm sure he was raiding many, many other nations as well. Uh, that I just throw this, this uh, di uh, diagram up here again, this kind of a diagram, just to remind you, you know, this is all, all of this area is what he came in and robbed the materials out of. Uh, whether it was uh, pillars or big basins or uh, all of those things that might have been found in there, he's kind of taken as he, as he pleases. Uh, there's some discussion as to whether he got the ark or not. I'm not in that discussion. So, uh, if you want to pick it up, then uh, read for yourself some other authorities on it. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, according, or including some of the royal family and of the nobles. So now we've come down to get, where this is the way we get to Daniel himself, and of course his friends whose names are Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. There you go, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. At least that's what they come to be called. Uh, I think they're... Uh, oh, Hananiah. Uh, also, Mishael, Hananiah, and... Uh, Azariah. Azariah, yeah. That's what their, that's what their uh, uh, Hebrew names are. Uh, they're given these other names, but we know them by Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego... They're given those things. We'll come across that text as we read in a minute anyway. So we'll get there. Uh, these are from the royal family or some of the nobles. These are kids probably or at least very young men uh, that uh, are brought out. Youths in whom has, there was no defect who were good looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge and who had ability for serving in the king's court. It sounds like they had to take a, a lot of tests. They had to look like a decent human being. Uh, they had to pass an SAT test. Okay, they didn't have an SAT test then, but you get the, the idea they had to show intelligence in every branch of wisdom. Isn't that an SAT test? Pretty much. Uh, endowed with understanding, discerning knowledge, so that these were people who had a capacity to learn and to think, and uh, uh, they, they were supposed to be uh, also, they had to have some sense, I suppose, of manners because they had to have an ability for serving in the king's court. Uh, had to have some sense, and you run across this in Daniel, I think, to the nth degree, had a sense of a decorum and how to deal with the things that came to him as a servant within the king's court. So, uh, and he ordered them, he ordered him, he had ordered Ashpenaz, there's your guy that we're still kind of the subject here, he's ordering Ashpenaz uh, to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. So, he expected these young men to have a fair idea of what was going on in the Hebrew faith, uh, pretty, pretty perceptive about all of those things, and all that they had developed in their expertise as young men, uh, came to bear here, but now we're going to layer on this. We're going to give you, we're going to teach you the language of the Chaldeans, and we're going to teach their, you their literature. So there's going to be an educational period here. 
The king appointed for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank and appointed that they should be educated three years at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. So these young men, Daniel, uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, are really kind of going to college at this point. They've got a three-year space of education in front of them. They've already had some uh, good education, otherwise they could not have passed the test uh, to get to be one of these choice people. And now we're going to start educating them, working at making them understand uh, the, the, the land and the people, the language, and the, the things that they have as stories in their culture, they want them to understand. So uh, this, is, this is what happens. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. And uh, these all have, these have, will have names too. Uh, if you look at Daniel and Mishael, for instance, you have the same ending on their uh, names. And uh, Hananiah and Azariah both, be, both have the same endings on their names. Uh, Daniel will be like, as I said, something like judge of God or, or adjudication of God, something like that. And Mishael will be sort of like, who is like God or who is God? And uh, Hananiah is uh, the given of God. And I don't remember, I'm trying to remember the term for Azar is, but it doesn't come to mind right now. Uh, but each of these names were given them with the idea that God would be exalted because of how they were named. And uh, I, 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 I like that. I like to think that uh, when somebody names a child, one of their first considerations is how does this, what, what do I hope my child brings to the game so far as uh, faith in God? And uh, each, each one of these men had that kind of a name. Their parent had given them that kind of name, which tells you that, that the faith of Yahweh, and that's what that, Yah on the end of Hananiah and Azariah uh, sort of references is Yahweh or Jehovah is how, how we've given that name out in the, uh, the King James Bible. But uh, Yahweh, uh, the, the, the worship of Yahweh and of, of God is obviously not destroyed before Nebuchadnezzar comes in. Otherwise, these men wouldn't have these names. Uh, but in any case, uh, these, these young men are chosen. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah Shadrach, to Mishael Meshach, and to Azariah Abednego. So that's, those are the names that we're all familiar with, uh, except for Daniel. You've got to kind of remember that. We know Daniel by his, his Hebrew name and Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego by their Chaldean names. So uh, keep that in mind. But they, Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Ever met anybody been in the army? been in the army, right? Jerry? Yeah. yeah. Uh, sir, I, I'm not sure I'd like to eat this today. Can I have something else? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you can. <laughs> it wouldn't go to fly, was it? <laughs> it just wouldn't fly. And and that's that's kind of, I need you to think of that, that, you know, if you're under, if you're under, uh, you, you've been basically cleaned out, arrested from your country, upset, and, and uh, you know, you're, you're in an upheaval situation, you finally have this chance to come into the court official, uh, and you, you may be actually getting to serve in the king's house or, or somewhere in his bureaucracy, and, you know, you, when you came here, you weren't necessarily getting to know what you're, whether you're going to eat or not. And here you come, and you're, you're, you're one of your first things you do once you pass all these tests, and you get 
sort of uh, enlisted here, you you say, well, I'm not too sure I really want to eat this or drink this. I, I would like something else. So, But watch how he does this. He says, so, so, so he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials, so he liked him. So he, it wasn't one of those things, you know, like, I already don't like you. You're, 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 you're out of my favor already. Of course you can't. Sit down. So uh, this is what happens. Uh, the commander of the officials said to Daniel, I'm afraid of my lord the king, who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? This guy sounds like somebody who's really... He's both concerned about what he does. He does not like the idea that he's going to have failure. He's good giving these men to, to educate, and here they come, and they want to change things. And so he, rather than uh, just being very dogmatic about things and just saying, no, buddy, that's too bad. You can't do it that way. Uh, you'll have to eat what I give you. And that's it. Uh, he doesn't say that. Instead, he, he gives him a reason. He just says, look it, uh, I'm under... I'm under compulsion here. I have to take care of you. I have to see to it that you don't look hanged off and you're not you're in a bad shape physically when you come here uh, because if that's the way I looked it, it shows badly on me and I can't have it. So uh, he, he's, telling, he's telling Daniel, then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. So he's, he feels that if he doesn't, if he comes off looking badly, like he can't succeed in his mission of training up these young men who are really chosen men and uh, kind of the elite, the best of the best from Jerusalem, uh, he, he's afraid that he might even lose his life because uh, of not making good on this. But Daniel, so Daniel gets the answer, and maybe he should have sat down, you think. But that's not what he did. Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, please test your service for ten days. And let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Uh, now, the, the commentary that I'm reading on this right now has a fascinating uh, discussion about now on what precisely he is asking to eat. Uh, because according to this man, uh, it, it's, it would read, and let us be given some seeds to eat and water to drink. So he's very interested in the seed aspect of whatever it was they're eating. He, he, he then goes on and suggests that, you know, that, that seeds, because they have so much uh, about, you know, they're going to, from a seed, when you put it in the ground, it has to develop. So it has to have its own energy uh, source right there inside of it. And so they're rich in nutrients. And uh, so he, he's just fascinated by the, what he thinks is the literal expression there. Let us be given some seeds to eat. Then let our appearance be observed in your presence and the appearance of the youths who are eat, eating the king's choice food and deal with your servants according to what you see. So give us ten days, feed us this way, just give us uh, water, and uh, let us have vegetables. If it is seeds, it could be a wide variety of things. If you think about it, you know, you could have nuts, you could have grain, uh, just about anything you can think of. If it's vegetation, it's probably going to have a seed of some sort that he could be eating. Uh, or the possibility also exists, of course, that this seed rootage is just basically seeing to it that it comes from the plant kingdom, and uh, so whatever they're eating will be something with seeds in it. Uh, so he listened to them. Uh, this is, I forgot his name already. Come on, Mike. Uh, Commander. That's not it. It's back here. Why won't my, why 
this matter and tested them for 10 days. At the end of 10 days, their appearance seemed better, and they were fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice food. Uh, so there you go. It worked out. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. Now maybe it's been suggested that uh, Ashpenaz was perfectly happy to do this because it was one of those situations if, if he's been given wine and uh, meat-based uh, uh, diet to feed to these young men, uh, you know, so, 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 so big deal more for me. You know, I can take home, uh, give, me, give me a box, uh, I'll take this stuff home to my, to my family and uh, my wife and, and kids and, and we'll do well on this. That's a possibility, but I don't, I don't make much of it. I, I think that, that Ashkenaz is probably highly in that place that was no worry on that basis. Uh, however, I want to stop right here to ask you, uh, why is Daniel determined not to eat meat? Probably because he was afraid that they were sacrificed. Perfect. Exactly right. They they would have very likely have sacrificed this meat to an idol in the process of getting it butchered and then uh, uh, cooked up. It would have been in somewhere in that process offered to or uh, dedicated to some god somewhere. Or another. So Daniel is basically uh, playing what you might say is a. a defensive faith game. In other words, I don't really want to uh, sully my uh, Yahweh faith or my God, my faith in God, the Almighty God. And I know my law tells me I cannot commit idolatry. And I know this, this meat's probably been sacrificed to the so I'm not doing it. I'm going to find a way around it. And uh, so Daniel, Daniel takes that line and is able to come out on the positive end of it, does not end up doing this. Now, were a vegetable sometimes sacrificed to idols? Yeah, sometimes. Uh, there may have also been another issue, uh, and that is that the Hebrew law said that if you were going to eat meat, it had to be properly drained of blood. Uh, plus, it needed to be from a clean animal. So there were some concerns here in the law that that Daniel is probably in response to. The idolatry issue, and then, of course, uh, the food laws themselves, what you were specifically supposed to be able to eat. As for these four years, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and, under, and wisdom. Uh, Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Why would you consider that quite intelligent that a person could understand a dream? Yeah, because I have crazy dreams. I do too. I have the most weird dreams sometimes. <laughs> yeah. And I, I think sometimes, I, I, I think about dreams. If I can remember the dream, then I tend to want to think about it and to see if there's any insight. Usually there's not. But, but it's, it's, it's fascinating to me because, see, I think that a dream is really it's math that's going on in your subconscious, is the way I would put it. In other words, you, we, we all know pretty much by now that there's, there's a conscious mind and there's also something besides that in our mind, in our head, that enables us to come up with things. Uh, I refer to this a lot in the, in the game of golf. Um, how hard do you hit a putt across this floor and have it stop at the right spot? Where is your math for that? I don't have any math for that. You just something tells you how, and you do, and you, you listen to that something, and so you try. And it's amazing how terribly accurate it is. And uh, I think that's true of dreams too. That there's something going on here that that is trying to help us. Uh, this is not. I'm not living outside my observation of scripture here, am I? How were the, how were the uh, wise men warned? They, were, they didn't go back to, to uh, Herod. They went back by another way. Why? Because they, was it because they had a dream? They were warned by God in a dream. Okay. Uh, how, does, how does Joseph come to think that he can marry Mary? He was told by God in a dream. Uh, time and again, uh, 
How does Joseph get in so much trouble in his early life? Well, he remembers a couple of dreams and tells his family. And they all get mad as he is about it. Uh, because they knew what the dream meant. <laughs> it was pretty obvious to them. Well, dreams have meaning, and this is what I'm saying. If Daniel was a guy that got it when you could talk to him about something that you dreamt, he was able to come up with some sort of solution to that and help you understand it. And he wouldn't have been alone in this. He just, that's one of the things he was gifted in. Uh, then, I won't say more about it. I don't want to uh, bog you down too much. But let me suggest that Daniel might have had a, a better connection, so to speak, to his subconscious mind than some. Uh, then at the end of the days which the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them. So they actually had an audience with the king. The king talked with them, and out of them all, not one was found by Daniel, Hananiah, uh, Mishael, and Azariah. So they entered the king's personal service. How many in all were uh, coached and trained up this way? I don't know. Uh, but enough so that these four were chosen out of the number and, uh, and, and put forward as the ones that would be the, the personal servants of the king. So this is a great big uh, a promotion for them. They really they get to be at the forefront of all of those that are their peers uh, right away. Uh, and this takes place apparently because of what we see happening in the second chapter uh, pretty early in their education. It doesn't take, they, they do this sometime, I think, before the three uh, years are up. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in all his realm. So they're really sharp guys. Uh, out of the, the, there's a question there about the translation of ten times, whether that's actually ten times or Kind of like if you have a, a meter, you can turn it from one all the way up to ten, something like that. Uh, so, but but obviously they were considerably better than everybody else that he met in his kingdom. So he was quite impressed with them. And Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. So this is he, he Daniel remains in the court of King Nebuchadnezzar all the way through his. Uh, reign as king. Uh, Daniel 2. Now, in the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Nebuchadnezzar had dreams, and his spirit troubled, was troubled, and his sleep left him. Then the king gave orders to call in the magicians, the conjurers, the sorcerers, and the Chaldeans to tell the king his dreams. So they came in and stood before the king. So these are the people who's already, they finished their three years, so to speak. I don't know that that's really the case, but what I'm pointing out is at this point, Daniel would not have, since it's the second year of the reign of Nebuchadnezzar, he would not have completed, these men would not have completed that three years of education, maybe one year, perhaps, uh, and maybe not even that, I don't know. But in any case, it was early on in their education. And uh, so the Chaldeans and the conjurers, the sorcerers, the magicians all get called in. They're supposed to stand there before the king and tell him what he asks next. The king said to them, I had a dream, and my spirit is anxious to understand the dream. Then the Chaldeans spoke to the king in Aramaic. Oh, king, live forever. Tell the dream to your servants, and we will declare the interpretation. The king replied to the interpretation, The command for me is firm. If you do not make known to me the dream and its interpretation, you will be torn limb from limb, and your house will be made a rubbish heap. But if you declare the dream and its interpretation, you will receive from me gifts and a reward, a great honor. Therefore, declare to me the dream and its interpretation. One way you die, other ways will lift you up, and it will make you cool. They answered the second time and said, let the king tell the dream to his servants and we will declare the interpretation. They were confident. They thought they could interpret the dream. The king replied, I know for certain that you are bargaining for time. Inasmuch as you have seen that the command from me is firm. I told you, this is how it's going to be. You're just trying to buy 
five times. And that if you do not make the dream known to me, there is only one decree for you. For you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until the situation is changed. Therefore, tell me the dream that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. The Chaldeans answered the king and said, There is not a man in honor who can declare the matter with the king. Inasmuch as no great king or ruler has ever asked anything like this of any magician, conjurer, or Chaldean. Moreover, the thing which the king demands is difficult, and there is no one else who can declare it to the king except gods, whose dwelling place is not with mortal flesh. Because of this, the king became indignant and very furious and gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. Now, why would the king uh, tell his dream? On the face of it, why would he not? There's kind of a face of it that you've seen here. Let me back up to where it is. Why would he tell? This is his reason he gives it. Reason he gave him was just because you stole it for time. That and he says, I need you to tell me the dream why. You need to tell me what the dream actually was. I'm not going to give it to you. You have to decide what I saw in my head, uh, and you have to tell me what that is. And be right about it and its interpretation. Why does he say you have to do that? Well, my thought on the matter is that then you know that you have some kind of connection to the gods or gods. Well, I think ultimately that is correct, and that this is what is here before you. He says that I may know that you can declare to me its interpretation. You know, if, if you can tell me, without me saying a word about it, I'm told a soul what I saw in my sleep. If you can tell me what I saw in my sleep, then probably you also have the power to interpret it. That's what he's saying. Rough crowd, though. I hate to work for him. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, my my uh, my commentary, my commenter, commentator, whatever, uh, the commentary that I'm reading, he says that he thinks that Nebuchadnezzar forgot the dream. Now that's happened, has it not? Haven't you woken up from a dream and it was a crazy, blasting kind of dream, and you can't remember? You just can't get to it. Remember part of it. Yeah, maybe just a snatch out of it, but nothing that you could really use. Also, and, and, and so that's what he's suggesting has happened. Somebody else has a There's also the possibility that uh, they can make up any kind of interpretation that they want. That, you know, you can de define a dream in several different ways depending on what your culture is or what your background is or what you think the king wants. But if you are uh, presented by God with the knowledge of what the dream is, then you've also been given the knowledge of what the interpretation is. What it means, absolutely. And I think I think that's that's a, another thing that uh, my commentary guy says. He says... Uh, Probably, if you look at, at the interpretation that Daniel gave, because uh, we see what the dream is here in a moment, and uh, we, we see its interpretation too, but he just points out that if you had this dream to work from, you could probably come up with a more attractive interpretation regarding the king than what Daniel came up with. <laughs> yeah. So, and, and that really goes to your point, that is that that, uh, and I think to the, the sort of suspicious wrath that Nebuchadnezzar has here, because that's kind of, you have agreed together to speak lying and corrupt words before me until this situation has changed. In other words, you, you think that you're going to get me to tell you something that you can use and you can, you can work it out. But I, I kind of got you guys paid. I think you have always been kind of the slimy type that will just make up anything in order to please me. So I'm, I'm not putting up with it. And by the way, I'm not, you, you can say whatever you want, but uh, I'm not going to allow you to put me off in hopes that this will go away. Uh, so, if you're a real magician,
magician, I hate to call myself that, then you can use magic, right? Yeah. I mean, that's why he's daring to use her magic. Right? Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think, I think this is, uh, what the Chaldeans say is fascinating to me because they say no one else can de declare it to the king except God. Well, why not ask them? You know? <laughs> Why, why not go to the gods if you if you believe in them and ask them what the answer is and then you know what you got unless of course they've really never done that much for you in the first place and you don't trust them or you know that they're nothing and you've never gotten anything out of them in which case well you, you, you're right here it's unless somebody was told by the gods they wouldn't know uh, so anyway the king was uh, very indignant the king furious gave orders to destroy all the wise men of Babylon. So the decree went forth that the wise men should be slain, and they looked for Daniel and his friends to kill them. Well, Daniel and his friends are being trained up, so they're part of this cast, you might see, or a group of men who are, uh, along with the conjurers and the uh, Chaldeans and the magicians and uh, probably astronomers among them, uh, or astrologers, if you like. Uh, so then David, Daniel replied with discretion and discernment to Ariok, the captain of the king's bodyguard, who had come, who had gone forth to slay the wise men of Babylon. Here comes this guy, sword drawn. Is your name Daniel? <laughs> he said to Ariok, the king's commander, for, for, for what reason is the decree for the king's origins? Then Ariok informed Daniel about the matter. Uh, so Daniel went in and requested of the king that he would give him time in order that he might declare the interpretation to the king. Then Daniel went to his house and informed his friends, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariel about the matter. Here are your uh, uh, Hebrew names uh, rather than the uh, Chaldean names. Uh, so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven. It's interesting. It's they're in Hebrew, and he's asking them to consult the Hebrew God so that they might request compassion from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his friends would not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. So uh, this is their first, their first request of God is to be a little fascinating, especially with what eventually develops, uh, with respect to what eventually develops. Because they go, they go asking God, oh God of heaven, uh, help us with this mystery, help us to work it out, help us to give uh, Nebuchadnezzar the right answer so that we're not going to die like the rest of these guys are going to die. <laughs> uh, that's the way that the request seems to be lifted up to God initially. Uh, then the mystery was revealed to Daniel in a night vision. Then Daniel blessed the God of heaven. Daniel said, Let the name of God be blessed forever and ever, for wisdom and power belong to him. And I think this is, that once, you, that once you look at the dream itself, uh, then you, you kind of know, and, and the interpretation of it, you kind of know that Daniel is saying this not merely because he's, he's glad that he's been fortunate enough to get out of dying, but because of the power of, and the revelation that God has turned loose upon him in order to uh, solve this problem for, for Nebuchadnezzar. It is he who changes the times and the epochs. He removes kings and establishes kings. He gives wisdom to wise men and knowledge to men of understanding. You, kind of, you can take that verse and you can say, life of Daniel right here. Or ministry of Daniel. The adjudication of God. Daniel. Uh, he removes kings, establishes kings, gives wise, wisdom to wise men, knowledge to men of understanding. It is he who reveals the profound and hidden things. He knows what is in the darkness and the light dwells with him. To you, O God of my fathers, I give thanks and praise for you have given me wisdom and power. Even now you have made known to me what we requested of you, for you have made known to us the king's matter. So it's almost like all this praise at the front end of his prayer uh, here grows out of the, the immense revelation that has come to him. And oh, by the way, 
thanks for letting us know this stuff so that we can we can respond to the king properly. Uh, so it's, it's a fascinating little prayer. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch of the king. Okay, mister, put your sword away. Therefore, Daniel went into Arioch of the king and appointed to destroy the wise men of Babylon. He went and spoke to him as follows. Do not destroy the wise men of Babylon. That wasn't in the prayer. But here it is. It's grown out of his, his uh, interchange with God somehow, I suppose, or something has taken place because it's not really after the prayer they made. They were just saying, keep us from dying with the rest of these guys. Now Daniel said, nah, wait a minute, don't destroy the wives in the battle. Uh, take me to send this to this Ariok guy that's in charge of killing them all. He says, take me into the king's presence and I will declare the interpretation to the king. Then Ariok hurriedly brought Daniel into the king's presence and spoke to him as follows. I have found a man among the exiles from Judah who can make the interpretation known to the king. And king said to, to Daniel, his name was Belteshazzar, are you able to make, me, make known to me the dream which I have seen and its interpretation? Daniel answered before the king and said, as for the mystery about which the king has inquired, neither wise men, conjurers, magicians, or diviners are able to declare it to the king. However, there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will take place in, what, in the latter days. This was your dream, and the vision's in your mind while on your bed. Now, yeah, I'm going to just try to get something going in your mind now, because I think that's... I'm not sure we're able in our time to really grasp this very well, because... You know, we don't really have very many people walking around the streets of Purdy saying, you know, well, you know, I'm, this week I'm going to I'm gonna pray over here to this God, and next week I'm going to pray to Venus, and uh, a week after that I'm going to pray over here uh, to, to uh, Zeus, and to, to, I'm going to pray to Mercury, and Poseidon, and I'm going to pray to these different gods, and nobody's doing that. If they think there's anything about God, they they're already imbued with the right idea, or fairly close to the right idea, that the God of heaven and earth, that's the one God there is. Nebuchadnezzar had no such a thing going on in his head. He was going to pray to X, Y, Z God the whole time. That's where he was. So for him to come to an encounter with the living God in such a tremendously powerful fashion, I just had a guy that not only claims he's from God, but he told me a dream in, in graphic detail that nobody else has ever heard that I dreamed. Nobody knew I did. So he's beginning to see that there really is a powerful uh, divine uh, being who can read his mind and give that same vision to another man. That this is a tremendous event. Of course it's tremendous to us too, but I think even more so to a polytheist, a person who believes in many gods. Uh, so, this, this is how it goes. As for you, O king, while on your bed, your thoughts turn to what would take place in the future. And he who reveals uh, mysteries has made known to you uh, what will take place. He's setting the, the tone here. He's saying, this is, and that's, that's a lot of what I want to know about my dream. Are we talking about something in the past? Are we talking about understanding myself? Are we talking about something that's going on in somebody else's mind? Are we talking about the future? You know, so he's, he's setting the tone. He's saying, this is about stuff for the future. Uh, that you, you've been made, it's come to you. But as for me, this mystery has not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man. Daniel's very careful to, to uh, give credit where credit is due. Uh, but for the purpose of making the interpretation of his dream known to the king, and that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. That's what's been done. And this is a fascinating thing also to me because 
This is not in keeping with what the motive for prayer was. The motive for prayer seemed to be, save us from the bad king Nebuchadnezzar so that he doesn't kill us with the rest of the uh, magicians and conjurers that he's going to kill. Uh, we don't want to die with them. But now it's, it's come that he wants to, Daniel wants to save them, but he's realized that, that God has shown this mystery to him so that it can be made clear to King Nebuchadnezzar. Uh, let's see, here we go. Uh, kind of complete that whole idea with both these verses, or at least both these slides. But as for me, this mystery has been, not been revealed to me for any wisdom residing in me more than in any other living man, but for the purpose of making the, king, the interpretation known to the king that you may understand the thoughts of your mind. And I, I, again, I think this is this is part and parcel of where we really kind of need to slow down just a little bit uh, and say that kings and rulers, governors, make up a lot of the subject matter in Daniel's dreams, visions, things that he dealt with. In this case, it's the king's dream, but he's still he's dealing with uh, rulers and kings. And uh, he is dealing with a ruler king right there in front of him. And uh, I, I want us to think about, well, why does God put people in where they are in, in terms of authority? Why is, why is Joe Biden our president right now? Why, why does that happen? That, you know, it's easy for us to be extremely critical of anybody, no matter who the president is, somebody could to be totally critical of it. But why? Why? What is God doing? Because we believe, or I do, that God is in control of these matters, that he is bringing about a development within the earth that at some point is going to result in this great big cataclysmic time when Christ returns and everybody is going to be judged and I sometimes wonder if the rulers who have been running the show in their realm, so to speak, whether they're going to be judged nearly so severely as we might think that they were. God gave them a role to play, don't you know, to a certain extent, I'm suggesting, in his time. And uh, uh, he's, he's bringing about an end of the matter. Certainly that's true. You don't necessarily know that to be true of every ruler, but it's the, it's the argument that Paul makes in, in Romans about Pharaoh, that God hardened his heart and so forth, because he was getting him to play a specific role in the time that he lived. So I just want to throw that out there to your mind and let you chew on it, argue with it, you know, come and talk to me about it, I don't like that idea, or whatever you want to do, and we'll visit it, because uh, it's just something I think bears the worthiness of your time to, to reflect about. It. Uh, the purpose of making the interpretation of the king that you may understand about the Lord. Okay, you, O king, were looking, and behold, and we're not going to get all the way through this tonight, but we'll begin. You, O king, were looking, and behold, there was a single great statue. That statue, which was large and of extraordinary splendor, was standing in front of you, and its appearance was awesome. And uh, I don't know what King Nebuchadnezzar is thinking at this point. Uh, he's thinking, oh, wow, he's on the right track. Or, or man, I forgot that. That, that is what it was. I, I'm not sure how his thoughts were developing, but it's interesting. He's telling this about this huge uh, statue, great splendor, very great to look at. Uh, his appearance was awesome. The head of that statue was made of fine gold, its breast and its arms of silver, its belly and its thighs of bronze, its legs of iron, its feet partly of iron and partly of clay. Uh, you continued looking until the stone was cut out without hands and it struck the statue on its feet of iron and clay and crushed them. Then the iron, the clay, the bronze, the silver, and the gold were crushed all at the same time. And became like chaff from the summer threshing floors. And the wind carried them away so that not a trace of them was found. But the stone that struck the statue became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. This was the dream. Now we will tell its interpretation before the king next week.
this is supposed to be a cliffhanger, so we'll come back next. That's time. right. That's right. Come back for its interpretation.